Well, um, Christmas is over, and what's next? New Year's, right? And so it's uh, all about getting ready for New Year's, and maybe you'll have some kind of celebration to start the new year. Uh, you'll put uh, to rest some good memories and some bad memories, and, and get ready to make some new memories, get ready to make some new plans. Uh, it's a time to start over, isn't it? New Year's Day is right around the corner. There was an, a, a, an important football game coming up, too probably that you're aware of on New Year's Day, um, and then maybe another important one after that. We'll see how all that works out. I have the uh, opportunity to go up to uh, Seattle, spend time with um, Misty's family, and he's going to watch a Florida team that he isn't exactly his favorite, and I'm going to watch an Oregon team that isn't exactly my favorite, and uh, we're going to go ahead and, and uh, have a lot of fun anyway on New Year's Day. Years ago in the Tournament of Roses, uh, there was a beautiful float that sputtered and quit. It ran out of gas. And the whole parade was held up until somebody could come with a container of fuel and uh, pour that in. And the amusing thing was the float was representing Chevron Oil Company. <laughs> so with its vast oil resources, the truck was out of gas. Often Christians uh, neglect our spiritual maintenance, and so uh, we're supposed to be clothed with power, as, uh, it was, as it says in Luke. But sometimes we find ourselves out of gas, out of steam. Isn't that the case? Sometimes as you go through life, you just run out of fuel, right? One day I was out in the Crescent Valley area, and I came across this guy that was walking down the hill with his gas can in hand. And I thought, man, I should give him a ride. But then I saw his car up there just a little ways, and it was less than 100 yards. So I thought, well, he doesn't need a ride. You know, he's just about there. The thing is, is um, it was a Prius. And I just thought that was ironic that a Prius would run out of fuel. I, I know it's possible, but that really caught me off guard. I wish I'd taken a picture. I know that would have gone viral. Um, our Christian lives are like that too, though, sometimes. We uh, think everything's going along fine, and we forget to fill up, and then we get caught short, don't we? Out there on the side of the road of life, as we're going along, we're wishing we had paid more attention to the things that would fill up our spiritual tank. And so we, uh, that's our discussion today, pressing on, being ready to press on. So I put that picture on the front of your bulletin today, and you see there about pressing on, and there's an on button there, and the idea is of pressing on, pressing forward, and fast forward, and I'm thinking every time you see one of those gadgets and you see one of those budgets, you, buttons, you might think about uh, this very thing about pressing on. I want to encourage you to reflect on pressing on in your spiritual life, too. So as I was working through Philippians, this little thought occurred to me in Philippians chapter 3 and verse 1. We're going to be looking at chapter 3 today in Philippians. And in verse 1, Paul wrote, Finally, brothers, rejoice in the Lord. It's no trouble for me to write the same things to you again as it's a safeguard for you. And I was thinking how glad Paul was to review things with his fellow believers. Now, at my age, I'm tempted to say, well, we've covered all that, and so how about some new truth? How about some new teaching? And I get tired of the basics once in a while, but Paul said it's good to go over the same things more than once. Repetition is one of the keys to teaching and learning to our growth and our development, our personal and professional lives as well. And so as more people were coming into the church at Philippi, they needed to hear some of those same things again, right? And Paul was saying it makes sense to review the basics. He even says it's a safeguard to hear these basics again. So keeping faithful to the basics like praying and reading your scriptures and encouraging each other. Jesus is God incarnate with flesh on. That's who he is. He died on the cross to pay for our sins. He was buried. He was raised to new life on the third day. The basics. Remember the Great Commission uh, to go into all the world and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them all that he's commanded. Or the great commandments to love the Lord your God with all your heart and mind and soul and strength and to love your neighbor as yourself. And yes, even the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. Remember to be humble and have the same attitude as Christ Jesus as it talks about in Philippians chapter 2. Remember not to be legalistic but to be full of grace is what Paul's beginning to talk about here in chapter 3. Putting on your confidence not in your own flesh and your own person but putting your confidence in Christ. He's saying, I want you to keep on pressing on in that relationship with God. And so as Paul talks about the priority of grace over legalism, Paul shares his battle against his former life and his new life in Christ. Changing over from a compulsion to behave according to a code of rules, he switched over to a conviction of entrusting his life to Christ. But he makes it clear that being a Christian is more than just a decision one day. Back in, you know, whenever that was, 
that you chose to believe in Jesus. It also takes effort to continue that relationship, to grow that relationship, to press on in that relationship. And so let's see what Paul says about that. First, he says, basically, take a run. In verses 12 and 13, it says there in chapter 3, verses 12 and 13 of Philippians, that we should take a run. He says, not that I have already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead. Paul's example is for us to keep running the race. Life is a marathon, not a hundred-yard dash around uh, the track. And Paul, even in some of his other letters, indicates that to be a Christian is to be an athlete for Christ in your heart. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 24 to 27, Paul writes about the race. In 1 Corinthians 9, 24, he says, Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, I do not run like someone running aimlessly. I do not fight like a boxer beating the air. No, I strike a blow to my body and make it a slave so that after I preach to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. Running has requirements. Running the race. One of those is to be diligent. To be diligent, disciplined, determined. Practice, practice, practice. Let's take piano, for instance like to just kind of show of hands. How many of you wish you could play piano? How many of you wish you could play piano? That's a lot of you. How many of you took piano play lessons as a kid? Raise your hands. Yeah, a lot of the same people, right? But how many can play piano? Well, and see, there's something that happened there, isn't there? Yeah. I'm uh, with you that can't play well. I took lessons for that obligatory year as a junior hire. My parents said, everybody takes lessons for at least a year. And so there was two or three of us that we took it for a year and then we were done. I remember my mom always talks about when my brother Ron was uh, playing piano on his last day of practice with his baseball mitt sitting on top of the piano. He finished his last hour, he grabbed his mitt, and he never looked back. And I wonder how many of us have kind of like that. And it's true with any skill, isn't it, or any talent, piano, organ, voice, guitar, drums, football, basketball, no pain, no gain. Basketball, I remember I have a friend, David Wood, who used to play for the Houston Rockets, and he played overseas as well as a basketball player, about 6'5 or 6'6. And uh, I remember he, he would say, I'm going down to the community center and I'm going to play. That was his ticket to college, four years of college. And he wasn't just playing, he was working, right? He was practicing. He got a full ride, including pencils. Football, I had a roommate in college uh, who had a scholarship to play football at Linfield. That's back, we won two championships when I was there, and I had nothing to do with that. But um, he did, he was part of the team. And I remember um, talking with him and after seeing firsthand his commitment to his time and his, his, uh, his game of football, I realized he had a job. They were paying him. He was playing football, but really it was just as hard as working at home on the farm. It wasn't as fun as it looked, he said. Practice, practice, practice. And so in our Christian lives, to win the prize, to look forward to heaven, we want to keep straining and striving for excellence is what Paul's saying. We want to uh, keep practicing, being diligent, being disciplined in our spiritual life. Paul would buffet his body for the cause of the gospel, he said. And he said, don't look back. Don't look back. Verse 13, it says again, brothers and sisters, I consider myself yet to have, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead. Straining toward what is ahead. Uh, I remember a ninth grader running in a track meet. And um, he was running down the track and he was, by far and away, the best. He was the fastest. He was out in front. And he was out in front, and I saw him, and I saw him look back to see where his competition was. And when he looked back, they gained on him. And then he looked to the other side, and they gained on him. And then he looked back, and they were getting closer. And then he looked back, and they were getting closer. And then he looked as they ran past him, because he kept looking in the wrong direction. 
He was looking back instead of looking forward. And so I encourage us to look forward, to keep your eye on the prize, right? Paul keeps his eye on the prize, the imperishable crown. What does it say again in that passage in 1 Corinthians 9, 24? Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only how many get the prize? One. Run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last. But Paul says we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Paul keeps his eye on the goal. It means he's got his eye to be full-grown instead of being underdeveloped, like a full-grown man rather than an undeveloped youth. It means that he's got his eye on becoming a person who's mature in his mind, like someone who's qualified to teach in a particular area rather than taking a class. that They're, they're qualified to teach it instead. And when we talk about offerings, he says without blemish that it's perfect to be offered to God and we're to be without blemish. How does that happen? It happens when we come to Christ, when we trust in Him, when we give our lives to Him, and He gives us life as well. That's when you accept Christ's payment for your sin. Through His death on the cross and His resurrection, you ask Him to forgive your sin, and you invite Jesus to come into your life and to be your Savior and your Lord, your leader and your guide, your rescuer and your deliverer. Then you become, without blemish, a perfect offering, complete in God's sight in the blood of Jesus, in His life. And it truly means to be perfect in Christ, to be complete in Him. To be mature in your walk with God means Christian maturity. Christian maturity in this life is one of our main goals, to always be growing, to always be changing according to God's leading in our life through His Word and His church and our relationships and circumstances in life. Paul keeps his eye on the goal, being in heaven with Christ. He's looking forward to heaven. I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God is calling me heavenward in Christ Jesus. There's that song I was thinking about, I can only imagine. I can only imagine what it will be like when I walk by your side. I can only imagine what my eyes will see when your face is before me. I can only imagine, surrounded by your glory, what my heart will feel. Will I dance for you, Jesus, or in awe of you be still? Will I stand in your presence, or to my knees will I fall? Will I sing hallelujah? Will I be able to speak at all? I can only imagine. Imagine being with Jesus. So keep your eye on the prize. What does Paul say there in verses 7 and 8 of chapter 3? He says, But whatever were gains to me now, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss for the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I've lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ. The prize is worth so much more than what this world has to offer. He was willing to throw away the past for the future. He was willing to say that everything he had accomplished wasn't even close to comparing to what Jesus had accomplished for him. He was willing to throw it all away, and he did. So Paul said to train like a runner, like a marathoner, not just a quick race, to be diligent. Paul said to take a run, but he also said to take a walk. To take a walk. And standing still is not walking. It seems like sometimes in our Christian lives or in our lives in general, we get to the point where we're just done, we're just stuck, we're just stopped. And what Paul's saying is to take a walk, to keep moving. In Philippians chapter 3, verses 15 and 16, it says, All of us then who are mature should keep such a view of things. And if on some point you think differently, then God will make it clear. Only let us live up to what we've already attained. Let us continue uh, to keep going and not to fall back. The maturity you have in your walk with God shows in how you live. Your level of growth shows your maturity in your relationship with Christ. Do you just talk the walk or walk the talk? Do you let your walk do the talk? Or do you just talk about it? Do you know all the answers? At Christmas, sometimes uh, we have a, <clears throat> a game that we uh, play on Christmas morning. We actually do Bible trivia questions before you can open your present. started a long time ago, and we're stuck with it now. So our son Richard is in Afghanistan. He's uh, Facebook or FaceTimed in, Skyped in, and he's there with us too. And he says, we ask a question, and I said, well, this is what we're doing. And he says, Jesus, 
Boom, done. Because, like, you know, that's the answer to most questions. <laughs> and uh, so he didn't win anything. He had his own presents we'd shipped earlier, of course. So everything was fine. But <clears throat> the question is, uh, what do we do with our walk? Do we just know all the answers or do we live them out? In the book of James, it says, what good is it if a man claims to have faith but not deeds? Someone's going to look at you and say, you have faith, but I have deeds. Show me your faith without your deeds, and I'll show you my faith by what I do. Just like a body without the Spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. Uh, I had a friend who helped me start a ministry. She was really the leader of that ministry, and it was a ministry where we would um, take things to folks that they had been homeless, but they were just getting set up in their homes. And so if they uh, were able to, um, to get into a place and get all the necessary items, then maybe they could have their kids back or uh, they'd pass their inspection and they'd get some assistance. And so uh, our church began to uh, be helping out uh, years ago with things like beds and bedding and dishes and dish towels and utensils. And, and well, then sometimes it was even like a refrigerator uh, or, or a stove or whatever it was that people needed. And it was amazing how many times... Somebody would say, do you have a refrigerator? We'd say, well, no, we don't have that, but, you know, we'll pray about that. And then a refrigerator would show up that next day. Or sometimes one would have just come in, and it's very rare for those big items to come in, but they would come in, and somebody would, um, somebody would call, and so it would be like God already knew what was going to be needed. And so it was a really amazing thing. Well, the gal, gal that ran this, um, her uh, stepson <clears throat> was uh, probably about 6'5", and he weighed over 300 pounds, played football. He was a lineman. And uh, we asked him to help with the three refrigerators. And I said, well, now how do you want me to get this? And he says, oh, it's okay, Pastor, I got it. And he opened the door, he reached in, and he picked it up, and he moved it and set it over there. <laughs> then he went and got the other one, and he did the same thing. And I was pretty amazed. Um, but what's happening is I, I was thinking that I'm not even sure if she was a Christian yet when she started that ministry, and I started helping her, and, and we were using our church building to store things and pass things out. And, and uh, she was a tough gal who learned about life through the school of hard knocks. Um, she couldn't even sit through a whole worship service in the beginning, but she was helping the, the homeless, and I didn't even know where to find them, but she did. She was living out her faith, and she grew in her relationship with Christ. She came to know him and trust in him and grow in him. She was living out her faith. And that's not the only way to live out your faith, but my point is, is that we have actions to back up our faith, that your faith shows. Your Christian maturity will show by how you live, by the things you choose to do and the things you choose to leave behind you. Remember, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead to the prize. So if you stop moving, you're not walking, right? If you stop moving, you're not walking. In Galatians chapter 5, verses 7 and 8, Paul wrote this. He said, you were running a good race. You were running a good race. Who cut in on you? And he kept you from obeying the truth. That kind of persuasion does not come from the one who calls you. So that doesn't come from God. It comes from somewhere else, from the enemy of our souls, or uh, can come from within, but it's not from the prize maker, right? It's not from the one who keeps the goal out there in front of us. It's not the one in whom we have our hope. God the Father is calling us and calling us ever closer, closer to the finish line when we cross over. No, in order to run the race, in order to keep you walking toward the prize, you have to keep moving in order to win. You don't stop in a race. You don't win that way. Chuck Swindoll wrote a book several years ago called Three Steps Forward and Two Steps Back. Some of you have probably read that. And, and he basically was saying you need to continue to step forward because there's times when you fall back, but then just keep going forward, keep going in the right direction. Like Dory the fish said in Finding Nemo, just keep swimming, just keep swimming, just keep moving, just keep moving, just keep believing, just keep believing, just keep praying, just keep praying, just keep reading your Bible, just keep reading your Bible, just keep living out your faith, just keep living out your faith. And keep on marching. Keep on marching. On a march, you follow the leader. And Paul was a real leader. A bad leader is someone who thinks they're le leading, and they look behind them, and there's nobody following. Paul was a good leader. And Paul says, follow my example. His marching orders are, follow me, 
You see in those movies and there's a battle scene and the general or the king or the person leading the group, the troops, gets up in front and makes a big speech and Paul said, follow me, follow me. What does it say in verses 17 and 20 and 21 there in chapter 3? It says, join together in following my example, brothers and sisters, just as you have us as a model. Keep your eyes on those who live as we do. Our citizenship is in heaven. We eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control. He will transform our lowly bodies so they'll be like his glorious body. He's saying, follow my example. Live as I do. Live as we do. Live as believers do. The part about being imitators of me, Paul says, some commentators say, most preachers wouldn't dare say that. Follow me, imitate me. But Paul really meant that. He says, oh, he said, uh, imitate me as I imitate Christ. How? Well, we don't march in the wrong direction. Sometimes people hear what God wants and they head in the opposite direction. Let's listen. Let's follow him. My daughter Susie directs plays at Sandy Am Christian High School um, and junior high, middle school. And so they have those down at the Majestic. And a couple of weeks ago they did uh, Beauty and the Beast and did the musical. And um, during the rehearsals, right, up, right before the performance, uh, one day before the performance, I think, um, some of the stage fell apart. And so pieces that were in the rafters came tumbling down, and uh, she was distraught. People said she kept her head pretty good, but that same day, while she's in this turmoil, a friend of ours, Dan, who's a drama dad, uh, some of his kids have been in the dramas over the years, um, he helped build some of the stage, not the part that Susie had built there, but um, he had been... Um, out driving around doing errands in town, and all of a sudden he felt like the Lord was saying, you need to go down there and, you know, just check on things. And he thought, well, the one thing I may, I know that's fine, and this one, it's got, you know, all those wheels, and it's, oh, it's fine, because he's an engineer. He's really sharp. He, he knew what he was doing and constructed it himself. And, but the Lord said, no, you need to go down there. He says, okay. And so he followed that nudge, and he went down there. And then he said, Susie, is there anything I can do for you? <laughs> and so he was there till probably one in the morning, putting that all back together and making it work, and it turned out beautiful. But my point is, is who was he following? He was following God. He was following the Holy Spirit. He was letting God lead him, and that was a good thing. As a Christian, your focus should be set on things above, set on things above. Paul said in Colossians 3, 2, set your mind on things above and not on earth. We need to focus on God, doing the basics of the reading of our Bibles and the praying to the Lord and the listening for God's heart and his thoughts for us of what he would have us do each day. We march on as citizens of another kingdom, and so we need to listen to him for our orders. And we need to keep pressing on. Whenever you press that button, I want you to think of that. One thing I do, Paul said in verses 13 and 14, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for God, for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Every time you press on, I want you to be reminded of pressing on in your relationship with Jesus. You've got to keep pressing on. Don't forget the disciplines of the basics. Prayer, Bible reading, growing, growing. Keep growing. Keep encouraging one another through fellowship and witnessing to those who aren't Christians yet. I want to read from a, a commentary that I read in this uh, passage from uh, William Barclay in, in the um, Daily Bible Studies series. And he says this, he says, Like any good teacher, Paul was never afraid of repetition. It may well be that one of our faults is our desire for novelty, for new things. The great saving truths of Christianity do not change. We cannot hear them too often. We do not tire of the foods which are essentials of life. We expect to eat bread and drink water every day. And we must listen again and again to the truth, which is the bread and the water of life. No teacher must find it a trouble to go over and over again the great basic truths of the Christian faith. It's a way for us to ensure our safety. We may enjoy the fancy things at a mealtime, but it's the basic foods on which we live. Back to the basics. Keep running forward. Keep walking upward. Keep marching onward. Keep pressing on for Jesus in our relationship with him. Let's pray. 
Heavenly Father, we come to you and we lift up your name and we thank you for how much you love us and how much you care about us and how you designed us to have relationship with you, how you designed us to continue in relationship with you, and that it's not all you, but there's our effort too. There's our part, our side of it as well, that we choose to follow you. We choose to keep pressing on. Lord, help us to do exactly that in this new year. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, as we sing, if